I have a confession to make. I think there's something profoundly beautiful about a brand new pack of cards. Clearly, it's just me. <laughs> now, really, every time I open a brand new pack, I get this feeling, this sort of a connection, like a symbiotic relationship between my brain and the cards. So if I get rid of the jokers and the advertising cards, uh, you can see the rest of the cards are in what you'd call new deck order, right? Ace through king of hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. When the cards are in order, my thoughts are in order. See, cards prefer to be in this sort of orderly state of tranquility. It's like a zen thing for cards. Yeah. Problem is, if I were to shuffle these cards, my words mixed up become a little. And shuffle a more bit and words might become confused more even. <laughs> Imagine can you now shuffle and keep if I understand one able you be to anything. <laughs> I digress, but. Said as before, I to cards orderly of prefer in be state and tranquility. Therefore, concentrate I, if enough hard, I force can my words back into order. If I concentrate hard enough, I can force my words back in order, which means my words are in order, it means my thoughts are in order. If my thoughts are in order, the cards should be in order. All I'd have to do is uh, fan through for myself. See the first one with the ace of hearts? No. If my thoughts are in order, the two of hearts, if my words are in order, the three of hearts, if the cards are in order, the four of hearts, every single card back in its original order once again. <laughs> Sorry, you can see my act is picking up. <laughs> It was January of 2013, I had the privilege and honor of performing uh, with 50 of the top close-up magicians around the country. Uh, it was actually Barack Obama's second inauguration. Uh, it was a beautiful black tie affair. Uh, it was at the Washington Renaissance Hotel, right in the district. And uh, I had just performed that trick along with a couple of others, dealing with uh, Schrodinger's cat and uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, just whimsical little fun things to card tricks. And this staunch but polite elderly lady came up to me and said, oh gee, I really wish my grandson were here to see you perform. And maybe her, her, maybe her grandson has a propensity for uh, quantum mechanics or an interest in Hugh Everett's multiple world interpretation or whatever, but barring that, as someone who likes to use kind of complex concepts or more, uh, more adult ideas to, to do magic tricks to, or, you, or use those tricks as metaphor for those concepts, it's not the most flattering of uh, phrases to hear. So why do we as adults respond this way to magic? Well, three reasons. First is uh, basically a recent change in the perception, the public's perception of magic. And by recent, I really mean only in the last 50 years or so. Uh, magic's historically been for entertainment, but it was also, it's been used uh, for religious reasons, political reasons, even to successfully stop a war. Really wasn't until uh, 1960, I mean the early 20th century, you might see a magician on uh, vaudeville or music hall stages. It wasn't that it wasn't for kids, it just wasn't exclusively for kids. Now, 1960 was the first time the world got to see magic on TV. Basically, it was the first magic TV show was Mark Wilson's Magic Land of Alakazam. It was a great show, and it did really did wonders for the magic world, but it also may have inadvertently created this precedent, this perception that magic's for kids, because it was targeted at kids. So if the large portion of the world sees magic for the first time on television and says, hey, this is for kids, those kids might grow up thinking that magic's for kids. They have kids of their own and so forth, and it, it carries on indefinitely. Now, the second rule, I think, is uh, it might be a, or a second reason, I should say, is it might be a defense mechanism. And by that, I mean nobody likes to be made a fool of. And yet, as magicians, we use the term to fool when it comes to a magic trick that successfully works, right? And that's terrible. So what, maybe what we're doing is when, uh, when a trick fools us, we look to a scapegoat. We look to someone that societally is acceptable to fool, a child. Well, a child doesn't have as much uh, life experience as I do, so of course they're going to be more amused, more amazed, and it, it's okay for the kid to like the magic tricks. Now the third reason that I think adults respond this way to magic is kind of the most interesting to me, and that is I think a good magic trick instills or can instill a sense of childlike wonder. You've just witnessed the impossible, and it brings you back to this moment in life when, just for a few brief moments, we forget what it's like to think we know everything. That's kind of a really wonderful moment. Well, what is childlike wonder? Well, you're born with it. It's literally the sense that everything is wonderful, everything is magical. 
And if you look at Piaget's study of object permanence of the first couple of years of life, uh, you see a very gradual understanding of how the world works in the most functional of ways, most basic of ways. Uh, a child isn't born with the instinct that when a coin is placed into my hand, it continues to exist. You know that, you have object permanence. You know the coin's going to still be there. To a child pre-object permanence, uh, that coin is out of sight, it's out of mind. Right? Let's get this one back, because I need it for later. <laughs> Uh, and illust I mean, children are always uh, encountering things they don't understand uh, they, because they, they're interested in learning. They, they're curious. They want to learn. They're also not afraid of being wrong and not knowing how something works right away. Uh, and then, furthermore, they're also st they're still continuously building upon their belief systems. They don't have a full, full solid set of belief systems. A, uh, to a person who still believes in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, uh, a well-executed card trick might not be quite as amazing as it would be to someone who has a little bit more jaded sense of reality. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've damaged anyone's childhood senses. But <laughs> uh, a great example of this happened a few years ago. My, my, my mother-in-law is a Head Start teacher for three and four-year-olds, and uh, one of the activities she engages with the kids sometimes is, is storytelling, at times with a little hand puppet. Now, it's important to know that she is not by any means a ventriloquist. She doesn't make any attempt to hide the fact that she's the one operating the puppet uh, or making the voice, and, and, and yet, at one point, the puppet talks to one of the children and, and addresses the child by name, and the kid looks up in awe and shock and says, how did you know my name? <laughs> and this is wonderful, it's beautiful, it's innocent, and to a person like that, anything is possible. And therefore, everything and nothing is magical. All right, so why is childlike wonder important? Well, it's not important, it's vital. Curiosity is the catalyst for progress. I mean, so much of today's science actually sometimes comes from yesterday's science fiction. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with Arthur C. Clarke, science fiction writer. Uh, he had three rules of predictions. The third rule is the most popular, most well-known, and that is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think that's pretty cool. I think even more apropos is his second rule, and that is the only way of discovering the limits of the possible are to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Think about that. Today's science fiction, today's science, yesterday's science fiction. I mean, if you think about uh, commonplace technology like a helicopter or a submarine, things we all know right now, they might not have been possible without uh, the fantasy world of Jules Verne. Uh, or that cell phone that every single one of you has right now in your hand or in your pocket has a direct lineage to the first communicators on Star Trek. As for me as a magician, I'm not out here trying to be this whimsical, silly little magician trying to get you to believe that I can do the impossible. Rather, I'm trying to get you to think that maybe for just a second, what you thought is impossible is not so impossible after all. So when did we lose childlike wonder? That's a, different, that's a kind of a difficult question. I mean, it's not like some switch was thrown and all suddenly we're, uh, we're not curious anymore. I mean, we've spent our entire lives building up little assumptions about how the world works, and we need these assumptions for survival and sanity. Most of us don't walk around saying, uh, worrying that gravity is gonna suddenly stop or we're gonna run out of air to breathe. Uh, we need those, and not having those assumptions would get in the way of how we function societally. So, uh, there's actually a great quote by a, a well-known magician within the magic community a few years ago. Jerry Andrus said this beautifully. He said, I can fool you because you have a wonderful human mind. Usually, when we're fooled, the mind hasn't made a mistake. It's come to the wrong conclusion for the right reasons. So we have these assumptions, and we need these assumptions, but sometimes we get carried away. Sometimes we, we lose wonder, and it's my job as a magician to get it back. I want to give you a little illustration here, because there's something about knowledge that I find very interesting. First off, you'll see these again in a couple of minutes. Not quite yet. <laughs> One of my favorite phrases in life is, a, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Uh, a couple of assumptions about knowledge. First off, that people think that the more they know, the easier, or the, the harder they are to fool. Actually, it's quite the opposite. The more you think you know, the easier it is for me as a magician to fool you. And I'll illustrate that with another comment we got a lot of times, and that is, boy, I bet it's really easy to fool a drunk person. <laughs> Ironically, it's not. <laughs> and in much the same way, it is not easy to fool a kid. 
And I realize I just awkwardly associated kids and drunks, but it's true. <laughs> it's true, uh, in many ways. Um, <laughs> When a, uh, you see, a drunk person, like a child, has a broad, wandering focus. It's not, they're not necessarily able to see what's right in front of them. They see everything, albeit maybe a little blurry, but finding the details is a little bit more difficult. Whereas a sober person, might, a sober adult, has, a, has those, those assumptions of life. They know what's right in front of them, and they're going to focus here. As a magician, I'm going to work in the periphery to kind of distract you away from the things that you think are real. Uh, and I'll illustrate this with a very old magic trick. It's actually the oldest trick in the entire world. And the first part of this exactly uh, actually will illustrate what I'm talking about, but I'll do the rest of it because I think it's kind of fun. It's called the cups and the ball. The more astute of you will notice that we're missing one of the key players, the ball, right. So magic wand is not really uh, useful, but it's useful for distraction. It's not magical, but it's a distracting tool. Uh, and technically it's called the cups and balls. We'll use a couple of them here. Uh, you can either use one, two, you can put them underneath the cup or you can put them on top of the cup. And then you use the magic wand to distract people from the third ball appearing on the cup. So. Thanks. <laughs> Fooled one person. That's good enough for me. <laughs> watch the ball. Don't watch the wand. It's just a stick. It's not imbued with any magical powers. It's just a stick to distract you from the moment the ball disappears. See, I got distracted. I was watching the wand myself. You get distracted by the moment the ball disappears. That's ball number one. Ball number two is a little easier for you to follow because now you know what to look for. Here's the ball in the fist. Looks like that one's gone. And then same idea with ball number three. Now you really know what to look for. Uh, they don't go through the bottom of the cups or anything like that. It actually happens. I'll give you a little flourish here right at the front so you can see this nice and easily. A little flourish, a little spin. It looks like it goes up the sleeve, across the chest, down the other sleeve, under the one, two, three cups, and balls. Oldest trick in the world. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, let's, let's get rid of all three of these. We'll mix them up and to make it into a three shell game. Now you know the three shell game, you have to guess which cup has a ball under it. It's a terrible game like this. Well, it's a great game for you, terrible game for me. Uh, I'll make this a better game for me. Uh, in fact, I'll make it a much better game for me. At this point, how many should be left? You'd say one. I'd say you're correct unless I cheated, and I cheated on your behalf by putting that one back. Technically, I had to practice cheating ambidextrously. It looks like that. That's ball number two. Uh, and the same idea. Now you'd guess how many would be left. You might say one. You might say two. There's actually three. I just don't know how all three get under the cup. One, two, and three. Thanks. Thanks. Let's get rid of all three of these completely, because uh, this is a game of assumptions. It's a game of misdirection. So now, if I put all three in my pockets, you see how many are left. You'd say none. I'd say, you're right. That's a, wait, that's not enough. That's a turnip. <laughs> you never know what's going to turn up. <laughs> That's a lame joke. Not as bad as a lime joke. There's a lime over here. There's the lime over there. It's not the cups and fruit or the cups and vegetables. That's the cups and balls, the oldest magic trick in the entire world. Thanks. We adults need to realize that we get stuck in patterns of certainty, assumptions, self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, we spent the first part of our lives cramming our brains full of as much information as possible. Once in a while, it's helpful to, to be reminded that there's always room for a little more. So the big question is, how do we get this childlike wonder back? Well, the first step, as always, is admitting there's a problem. There is. <laughs> uh, the biggest in inhibitors to our curiosity, to progress, is the naysayers in our brains. And the best thing we can do is to try and shut them up. And that's where the magician comes in. And various mythologies around the world have, often have a trickster character. You know, the coyote, Iktomi, Anansi the spider. The trickster is the character, is the, the, the protagonist that goes throughout the story and challenges people in various ways to teach them the ways of the world or morality. The trickster is an important character. And the modern magician can, and I think sometimes should be, that trickster. My job as a magician isn't to try and convince you that I can read your mind or predict the future or, or alter the laws of physics. It's just to simply ask you, are you sure? Or why to all the things, the assumptions we've built up over our lives? It's to challenge those, those patterns of certainty for just a few brief whimsical moments to get you to think, hmm, maybe that's not so impossible after all. I'm going to finish up with one last little performance here for you. Uh, take a few minutes and do something with, well, actually, we use this one here. 
silver dollar, very old silver dollar actually, 1925, I think this one's a little bit older yet. Yeah, it's two. Uh, what we'll do is use your imagination for a second. Just imagine, uh, well you imagine, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend, I'll pretend to amaze you, you pretend to be amazed, we all go home happy, so. <laughs> three coins, use your imagination, imagine what it would look like for all three of these coins to disappear. Obviously they can't, but imagine the first coin, I'll show you, the, uh, back to object permanence right now, you know the coin goes in my hand, you know it has to be there, right? That's the idea, that's the assumption I'm gonna work under and try to use that against you, uh, your own assumption. Let's see, one, two, that should be one. That leaves me with two. I know, it freaked me out too. <laughs> Same idea with the second coin. Second coin, watch carefully, you balance it right here at the fingertips, give it a little wave, a little snap. It looks like that one's gone too. Now that one didn't disappear, everyone's saying up the sleeve. It's not up the sleeve, it's behind the sleeve, a slight variation on a theme, so. And that was pretty loud. You probably even heard the clink in the back of the room. Let me, uh, let me make that sound disappear. Make the sound disappear, we make the coin disappear. We're down to one. One last coin, one last time. Watch it carefully. You wanna see how this works? I'll show you, I'll show you. I feel, I feel like we're friends here. This is what happens. I shouldn't be showing you this, but uh, what happens is we start with a magic marker. It's cheaper than a magic wand and it's more permanent anyway. <laughs> watch the coin, watch the marker. The marker actually starts up my sleeve. I'm not supposed to show you this, it goes, that's where it starts. When I need it, I pop it out of my sleeve, shake it out of the sleeve like this, and we create a little suction, a little vacuum, negative pressure inside the cap, like that. So when I need to, I go one, two, three, the coin actually pops inside the marker, and then it goes back up the sleeve, and that's how we get it done. <laughs> cool. I sense skepticism somehow. So, so I'll show you again slowly, here we go. Cap, marker, we go like that, pops out of the sleeve when I need it. I'll do it visually this time. Here's the coin, here's the marker, go one, two, three, the coin jumps inside the marker. That was not slow at all, I'll slow it down for you. Really slow, here we go, watch the coin, watch the marker, nice and slowly. That's one, that's two. It's behind my ear, yeah. <laughs> Someone had to point it out eventually. Everyone's watching the coin, uh, they don't notice the marker. It's misdirection, everyone's watching the coin. Actually, and if I were to ask you, do you know why the marker goes behind my ear? It's to distract people from the coin disappearing. <laughs> so the coin's actually right here inside the marker. No, I'm sorry, the coin's actually inside my ear. If you watch carefully, coin's inside, but watch the marker instead. I am so confused right now. <laughs> Let's do this really slowly. Here's what I'll do, I'll show you how this works. No, I won't. <laughs> Oh, come on, I lie for a living, that's my job. <laughs> but I'm nice about it, I tell you I'm gonna lie, then I do, so watch the coin one more time. If I put my hand over the coin and I'd ask you, can you see the coin, you'd obviously say no. I'd say why, albeit a patronizing question, you'd say, well, because your hand is covering it. And it is, my hand, you see the back of my hand, not the coin. So, it would stand to reason if I took this, which is nothing, it's a small piece of nothing, but it's nothing nonetheless. If I put nothing on top of the coin, now you can't see the coin, because nothing's in the way, right? <laughs> Take nothing out of the way, you see the coin again, right? Or, or you put nothing on top of the coin, it's just a matter of perspective like this, turn the whole thing over, now you have a coin on top of, let me use a smaller piece, I've got a smaller piece of nothing. This is actually too small to cover the whole coin, but it'll give you the idea. Put the small piece of nothing right over, it should look like it, there we go, looks like it's partly gone. Let's, uh, it's, it's actually too small to cover this here, I'll toss this out to the audience, that's for you guys, just never tell anyone that I never gave you nothing. That's a really long way to go for that joke. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna finish this once and for all. And at the end of this, some of you might say, gee, I really wish my kids were here to see it. <laughs> and that's fine. But hopefully, along this little journey, I've managed to inspire a little wonder in you as well. <laughs>